you. Are you, uh, you have any other sediments? Oh, this is the last one. This is the last one. Okay. Where do you want to go? Sunday morning. Okay, so I'll, I'll, I'm around through Sunday too. See It's Amanda's place, right? No, 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 you can sit. No, it's me. I'll not do anything, I'll just sit. So we have to move here. Yeah. 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 So please get everyone to, to take your seats here, and if, uh, if everyone can try to move forward as much as possible, I know we want to. Uh, it's a big room, and so we don't want to have to go too far back if possible. Uh, we want to get started here. Uh, just as a quick word of introduction uh, from Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain uh, for putting on this event. Uh, you know, we've had. Uh, some experience working with with other civil society groups uh, uh, who, uh, in in the in both in the Middle East and North Africa region, uh, but just some partners that we we've, we've had discussions with. That, uh, there's a, there's still some uh, some lack of information, or some there's a, uh, there's still a need, I think, for for furthering discussion of how NGOs can better engage with with UN mechanisms and, and work with documentation of human rights abuses on the ground as well. Those sort of the, how we came at uh, putting together this event. I want to thank Civicus for also uh, co-sponsoring this event with us and, and uh, for our open for chairing this. Um, and so we're going to turn it over to Tor uh, to take it away with the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, and to ADHRB for organizing this very important event today. And also let me extend a warm welcome to our panelists and to the audience for participating in this event during a very, very busy council week. My name is Tor Hodenfield, and I work with Civicus World Alliance for Citizen Participation, based in Johannesburg, South Africa. Civicus is an international alliance of civil society groups based in 130 countries across the world. Our mandate is to protect and promote the work of civil society and enhance citizen participation. As Michael mentioned, Today's event will focus on ways to empower civil society to document human rights abuses and utilize that documentation when engaging with UN human rights mechanisms. As you may have noticed, it's an, it, this is an exclusively male panel. I can assure you that all efforts were made to secure a representative, um, female representative to join us today. For logistical reasons, this proves impossible. Before I introduce our panelists, let me begin by pointing out the basic premise of this event. While identifying strategies to document human rights violations and engage with UN human rights mechanisms is an ongoing dialogue and remains a permanent fixture to how to promote and protect human rights, this event takes on added importance and pertinence in light of the unprecedented waves of legislative and extra legal restrictions being imposed on civil society across the globe. Across the globe, we are witnessing the imposition of undue legislation to restrict expression, association, and assembly. We are witnessing the excessive and sometimes deadly use of force to disperse protesters and the continued use of judicial persecution to silence activists. By almost any indicator, these issues are afflicting not just nascent democracies in the global south, but are increasingly impacting consolidated states and democracies in the global north. As I mentioned, by, by a number of indicators from global institutions, the space of civil society is shrinking. 
according to ICDN now, at least 118 laws have either been proposed or adopted since January 2012, unwarrantedly restricting the rights to assembly and association. According to frontline defenders, in the first 10 months of 2014, 130 human rights defenders were killed. Civic cases documented 150 cases of imprisoned activists, trade unionists, and journalists in prison in 2014 alone. And finally, Freedom House in its annual report documented declines in civil liberties and political freedoms for the ninth consecutive year. In light of, of the shrinking space nationally to address human rights violations and hold government to account, it is increasingly important to identify innovative strategies to monitor and document human rights violations at the national level. It is also equally important to elucidate potential avenues to engage with the international human rights community, including the UN, to mobilize support and engage with international actors. Today, to discuss these issues, we have a cross range of actors from OACHR and civil society. To my left, we have Safir Saeed from the civil society section of OACHR. To my right, we have Saeed Yusuf, the vice president of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights. And to my left, we have Roland Saeed, the executive director of UPR Info. We will have one round of questions to the, to the panelists. And then we will open the floor to you for questions, and then we will follow up with conclusions and recommendations. So, Fear, I will first turn to you to hear about your work at the civil society section of OHCHR. So, Fear, there are a number of approaches to engaging with OHCHR at the national, regional, and international level. However, to focus this conversation, it would be interesting to hear about what steps do you think national civil society which can take to internationalize their issues and engage with the UN Human Rights Council its various mechanisms, and OHCHR. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tor, and the organizers for, for this, and for this opportunity to, uh, to tell you a little bit about uh, our work at uh, the campus. Um, so I am uh, part of the, the civil society section. It's, uh, it's uh, the, uh, a unit in, in, in the Office of the High Commissioner, which, which in, in simple terms is, is about helping uh, civil society actors organized around uh, international human rights standards. So the kinds of things we do is we, we uh, share information about what international standards are activity, what uh, resources are to So it, it's, it's a way to build Participation of civil society with the UN human rights system. So, uh, um, by that I mean uh, we we try to explain in, in accessible ways uh, what the value of the system is, um, what you know, what the the, the, the different uh, and uh, society the in, in the, in the question of protecting civil society space. So, um, uh, civil society is, is a, an integral partner for, for the office, uh, and it's a new thing to, to help uh, ensure that they can work uh, uh, freely and independently. So that's roughly what our office does. Um, this morning, I just, uh, I wanted to, to, to to, to just share maybe some um, some ideas about about engaging with, with the UN human rights mechanisms. Uh, first, uh, I, I think I wanted to 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 draw attention to, uh, or I suppose uh, uh, make a reality check. In, in a way. Um, everything that we do, um, uh, it, it's going to to carry on irrespective of what the United Nations Human Rights Council or what the UN does. Uh, your work carries on um, to, to promote non-discrimination, accountability, uh, human dignity, inclusive participation. So, so it's important to, to, to keep in mind that, uh, that uh, in, in, in this big picture of, of, of change, uh, 
the the UN is, is just one element. Change is really difficult, right? We, we just have to accept that it's it's slow, it's hard, and uh, and sometimes it's it's, it's dangerous. Um, in, in in a sense, it's it's too easy to say that that the uh, that the solutions lie at the UN, or that change we can or, or to oversimplify the how easy change is. It's change is about changing ideas, changing behavior. It's it's long term, and it's going to to uh, mean that you have to address fears of, of change. Uh, it's change is 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 very disruptive. It, it causes disorganization. There's a lot of elements that, that take place, and a lot of work needs to happen, and it takes a long time. So it's it's just to to, to sort of situate the, the the enormity of of the work that you're doing, and, and to 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 manage your expectations in a way of, of what is uh, um, possible. I've just put up a slide on the screen, and it's just to, to, to in a way, to simplify um, the, the need to engage as many actors as, as you can in order to find a, a certain solution to your problem. The UN is just one element. Huh? I mean, we have, uh, and, and, and it's the international element. We have, we have all the actors at, at the local level, and we also have actors at the international level. The most important, of course, are the, are the national level actors, and the UN um, is, is one way where uh, organizations can, can, can bring and, and share information at, 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 the, at an international level. Very broadly speaking, we have, uh, at, in the UN human rights system, we have essentially three ways of, of engaging with organizations itself, um, uh, whether they're, they're the OHCHR, UNICEF, UNVP, ILO, refugees, essentially all of these organizations are working to promote and uh, pursue human dignity. Ultimately, their work is, is human rights work. Uh, secondly, we have the, 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 the treaty bodies, the treaty system, this, this network of international instruments which create uh, monitoring mechanisms for how states are able to, to implement uh, human rights uh, obligations. So essentially, um, they, they provide, uh, a, a not, we have nine international human rights treaties, at least within the UN framework. These provide nine entry points for, for sharing, for contributing, and for, for, for benefiting from information. But those are nine ways where you can bring information about if, it, if it's questions about violence against women, um, potentially you can bring these issues before the, the CEDAW committee, or for the Human Rights Committee, or from the, the Convention Against Torture. I'm, I just wanted to share with you that these provide you with many, many opportunities in order to, to participate. Uh, thirdly, we have the, the, the intergovernmental processes, the, the, the political processes, processes, if you will, where around the table it's member states which are discussing human rights issues. And, and within within the the, the assembly itself, um, there is there is a means to, to, to participate, to bring issues, and and, and, and to, to engage in dialogue like we are doing right now. Um, also, these these intergovernmental processes, like the Human Rights Council, creates uh, associated mechanisms like like the system of special procedures that you may already have heard about, or the Universal Periodic Review. Now, with, with the special procedure system, we have about uh, about 60 entry points where, where civil society actors essentially can, can bring information, can, can draw attention to different issues depending on the, the, the topic, whether it's uh, arbitrary executions, uh, freedom of religion, the right to food. These are all entry points where civil society can bring information about a particular country or, 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 or more generally. They can, they can also address complaints to to these mechanisms as well. And uh, thirdly, uh, we have the, the the Universal Periodic Review, another important uh, venue forum in the international level where civil society again can can participate in, in different ways. So, all all of this to say that that the UN human rights system provides a lot of, of entry points or opportunities for for civil society. 
essentially what all these mechanisms do um, are um, they, they rely upon documentation. It's important to have good, solid, uh, credible documentation. Um, this is essentially what feeds the system. Um, it's, it's about recording the stories. Um, it's about documenting them. Um, in, in, in it's, it's also a, about uh, using the, the, the elements that come out of the mechanisms, the, the documentation in terms of advocacy tools. Um, <coughs> Um, also, the, the second thing that these mechanisms provide are uh, an arena to participate. Very uniquely at the international level, um, civil society actors can come, can, can have their voices heard, can express uh, either their, their, their situation, contribute their expertise, and, and, and help uh, work with others to, to, to develop other standards. Okay, so it's, it's an essentially documentation and participation. In, in a broad sense. So uh, by, by, by contributing, um, by, by, by participating, essentially what you can get from the international level are our are, are findings, our conclusions, um, our, our statements, our appeals from different actors across the human rights system, whether they're the High Commissioner, uh, the, the President of the Council, the, the different experts of the of the uh, special procedures, the, the outcomes of the universal periodic review, um, uh, or, or the, the, uh, the, the conclusions and observations of treaty bodies. And with these, uh, civil society actors can use them as, 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 as arguments, as strategies, as, uh, as, as advocacy tools to, to promote change at the local level. Um, what's important to realize also is that, that uh, Oftentimes, what's happening uh, in a particular country um, is not new, in the sense that it, it's it's very likely that it's happened somewhere else, and that there is a lot to learn from from uh, similar situations in, in other countries, and so that we don't have to repeat some of the the, the learning strategies, the the arguments that that one can pose to public authorities or to to others on the ground. And, and I think I should probably stop it there, um, and, and I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I also wanted to, to draw your attention to the fact that the civil society section has, has produced two, um, two new uh, publications, one on the civil society space in the UN human rights system, which, which explains essentially some of the, the, the elements of what I've just said and, and provides some resources um, where, where you can go to, to Further information, and uh, secondly, there is a publication about what you can do with, with the recommendations that come out of uh, the, these human rights mechanisms. So, in a way, um, how how to use these to advocate for for the, the different uh, changes uh, that uh, the recommendations are encouraging. Thank you, Sophia, for the very comprehensive um, presentation. This is an issue that we could speak for, for days about. We do do trainings on how to engage with the UN. And it takes us, sometimes a week, but we, yeah, we only scratch the surface. So thank you very much for, for, for the concise presentation. Just to follow up very briefly, um, you mentioned that documentation is, the UN relies heavily, uh, among other things, on documentation for civil society groups. What would your suggestion be to suicide groups um, working nationally that don't have an OHCR tentative input and that don't necessarily have access to these resources? How would you suggest to them to engage to, with um, the UN's government if it is not, um, if their challenge is national to do so? So, uh, um, I, I, think, I think that that's the reliance on documentation is, is a challenge because it's a question of, of uh, on the one hand, the, the, the information that is produced by the system needs to be accessible. It needs to be accessible in terms of <coughs> language that is, is, is easily understood and not uh, uh, convoluted and, and complex and vague, and it needs to be specific. So I think there, th that's a challenge that the system needs to deal with. Um, also, the fact that uh, much of the 
the information that comes out of the system is, is, is in, in just the, the six languages of the community. So Arabic, French, Chinese, Spanish, uh, English, and, and uh, Russian. Um, so in, in those six languages. So it, it poses a, a challenge for, for, for those countries or those, those communities that don't use that language. And, um, and so there is a need for, for this information to be, to be translated. On the other hand, for, for, for national actors to, to share information to the system, um, um, I, I think uh, we're still at, at the stage of, of, of communication and correspondence where, where we rely upon um, either you know, uh, transmissions through, through email or electronically or, or through, through post, etc. Those those options are there. There, there. I think uh, um, that's probably the most direct way to to, to share and to convey information. Um, um, I I think uh, the other colleagues will, will be able to speak about about strategies about how to, to share information, maybe more regionally or, or within within countries uh, when when sometimes. Uh, Things like electronic communications or email or internet or that uh, poses a, a challenge. Um, I think, uh, um, yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I think I'll leave it there. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, this is an issue that we, civic and of course, APHRB, um, are continually trying to address with the, the how you increase access, accessibility to the UN. Um, Sayed, I will now turn to you. Um, Sayed, it's been well documented in the environment for civil society in Bahrain is one of the most conservative in the region, if not the world. Um, very few independent civil society groups are able to operate in the country. And civil society representatives are routinely harassed in, in prisons. So it would be interesting to hear, to, before we discuss your actual process, to hear about the context in which you work. What are the specific challenges that you face at the national level to do your work? In general, in particular to DTHR, your organization. Yeah, first of all, uh, thank you. And uh, I'll talk about the general picture that uh, we are uh, documenting. Uh, uh, we are in a situation that uh, a uh, very critical situation towards uh, civil society in Bahrain, the political uh, society and the human rights society. <clears throat> and it is worse uh, than ever, uh, especially when the Arab Spring started uh, in Bahrain in 2001, that uh, have been escalated in Bahrain. Uh, you are in a situation where uh, 3,500 prisoner detentions uh, in Bahrain with a population of uh, 500,000. When it comes to arresting journalists, we are in a situation where Bahrain is the highest per capita. Uh, nearly 100 protesters killed by police uh, from 2011 until now. Uh, almost 130 activists, uh, Bahraini activists, nationality were reported by the government, and some of them have been deported outside the country. Civil society cannot work freely without retaliation or reprisal uh, in Bahrain. Most of the human rights defenders, whether in jail or in exile, uh, they cannot work freely in Bahrain. NGOs, including BCHR, is not allowed to work uh, legally uh, in Bahrain. Our website is blocked. Uh, independent uh, NGOs also are not allowed to uh, register legally in Bahrain. There is the civil society law, which has been uh, launched recently. It's given a lot of uh, restriction towards civil society and it gives the absolute power to the minister. He can assume who, can, who, will, who will get the permission to work legally uh, in Bahrain or not. And there are a lot of NGOs apply, and uh, including Bahrain society, they try to apply in this, uh, in this law and they were rejected. Also, you are in a situation where we have the terrorist law. Uh, the terrorist law gives the absolute power to the, to the public prosecution in Bahrain to arrest the protester uh, or activist up to six days. 
where in this uh, time people and protesters are being subjected to court disappearance and torture and mistreatment uh, in the jail. Uh, you are in a situation you know, where most of the NGOs are registered outside the country because you cannot, you are not allowed to work in Bahrain. And uh, BCHR is not registered in Bahrain, uh, it's registered in Copenhagen, ADHR is not allowed to work uh, registered in Bahrain, Baird is not allowed to register in Bahrain, Salam. And so on. So this is the situation, the general situation that we are documenting the human rights abuses with this uh, situation. Thank you, sir. Um, Sayed, um, despite all of these challenges, BCHR has continued, and other groups have continued, continued to be able to document human rights violations in the country, despite the harassment judicial persecution and legislative restrictions. You have maintained a robust, robust documentation structure. Can you tell us a bit about how, in light of these challenges, you've been able to monitor and document human rights violations? Yeah, well, I'll just say, first of all, about working in documentation. And working in documentation uh, uh, in Bahrain is not an easy work, as maybe other people think. Uh, you will pay a high cost uh, if you are working in documentation. Uh, for example, uh, in the last two years, our, our president, uh, he was in jail. Uh, uh, I, I know that some members are in jail, others are in exile, but still we have a strong uh, network and a big team uh, in the ground documenting the human rights abuses. We have, of course, a number of volunteers uh, working with us uh, in prison for human rights. On, on a daily basis, they are uh, uh, documenting uh, the human rights abuses in the ground, interviewing Victims, uh, taking pictures uh, from the ground, from the protest, from, from the victims, from the injuries, uh, taking videos. We take the information of course directly from the victims or the family members uh, who was arrested or from the lawyer. Uh, and, and we are doing that on, on a daily basis despite the, the threat. Uh, about the threat and, and the challenges, I would just uh, give a few examples. For example, I mean, if you went in, in the ground uh, in Bahrain, take you to jail. Uh, myself, uh, for example, I was arrested twice uh, in Bahrain for doing documentation. Uh, when in the capital, Manama in 2013, I was taking picture of a protest be, uh, being attacked by police and shooting the rubber bullets. So I, my, my rule is to take picture and uh, to document what's happened. And then 15 minutes later, they, uh, the, the police came to me and arrested me, kept me in, a, in the jail for 40 days in a solitary confinement for just that a tweet that I published uh, documenting what happened in, in that day. And another time, uh, I was arrested in a village called Jaraz. Uh, I was taking picture of an injury. who was shot by a shotgun injury, what we call the bear shot. So I take picture, and then they arrested me for also three weeks uh, for doing that. So uh, documenting, taking picture in, in Bahrain, take you uh, in jail. Even away from the jail, also there are other obstacles. And, uh, for example, even documenting in the ground, you could be kicked, you could be beaten. Uh, so I also can give like that. For example, uh, one time I said, and then I have been sentenced uh, to three years recently. We were documenting and taking picture of a protest in a village called Puri. And then the police came to us and shot tear guys directly at us, but did not hit me, but it hit them with a watch in her leg, and her leg was broken. Uh, so even documenting, this is the cost uh, that has happened to you. Also another example, one time, myself and Nabil Rajab uh, in a village called uh, Jufair, uh, one protester, uh, Ali Benda, who was killed by the police, so we went to that village to take picture of where he was killed. So the police directly, they know that we are coming to document, so directly they shoot tear gas at Nabil Rajab. So you can be tear gas attacked. But also, another time in a Bilad, in Bilad al Qadim, one time it was an uh, event attacked by the police. And I was taking a picture of uh, Sheikh Ali Salman who was being tear gas uh, directly uh, at the head. Uh, so in that time, they came to, uh, to me and they, they beat me because they, they told me, don't take picture, don't take picture. And they started beating me more than four five minutes. So this is the, the, the challenging that you, we are facing, but uh, at 
until we take the information, we, we have to use it in a uh, three-part process, for example, after gathering the information from the victim, after doing the recommendation, we do the first thing, we do the, uh, the UN mechanism. We have the, the team in the Center for Human Rights, along with ADHRB and PIP, uh, we are gathering the information and filing a, a complaint uh, uh, to the special rapporteur on, on torture and, and, and court disappearance and, and the human rights defender and arbitrary detention. Even uh, the, the, the latest one was about the Lulu was where it was demolished uh, by, the, by the government of Afghanistan. It was a statement released by the special rapporteur condemning that uh, this was demolishing the culture. Uh, so we do this kind of the, the meeting and the file complaint and we cooperate with the UN mechanism and this is the way the number one we use the information and the documentation we we, we do it with, uh, and we share it with the UN mechanism number two we share it we do it for the advocacy uh, we give the, the people responsible for advocacy the number the conclusion the figures the, the fact what happened the result of the conclusion of the recommendation and they can advocate it advocate it advocate for human rights uh, and for the nation and uh, in the meeting states and, and in other uh, places. The third thing uh, we do also the multimedia. Uh, we do the we do the recommendation in Bahrain we, we do the uh, multimedia and the social media after we take the information from the victims that we publish his picture, we publish it in the internet uh, to tell them what was happening uh, uh, in Bahrain and also to update the media what's happening in Bahrain, especially in a situation where media is not allowed to come to Bahrain. Fisher reporter was not allowed to Bahrain, but the, the latest one is uh, Fisher reporter of Tokyo, who was not allowed to come to Bahrain. And he, two days ago, he wrote a statement saying that still he is prevented. So, this situation that media, Fisher reporter, is not allowed to come to Bahrain, there's a, to, uh, the responsi there is a huge responsibility on the people on the ground who are documenting the human rights abuses to tell the world outside uh, what's happening uh, uh, in Bahrain uh, despite the ban of the government. Uh, Thank you, Zayn. Um, this, this is an issue that we see afflicts countries across the world, not just Bahrain. The restrictions on independent groups nationally and the need to identify creative means to effectively monitor human rights violations in the country and share with the international community. Um, just one very brief follow-up question. Can you briefly tell us about how you coordinate with other groups in the country to document human rights violations? You don't have to name specific groups, but tell us a bit about how you work with international human rights institutes, organizations, and national groups to, to coalesce behind the victims. Well, I mean, of course, we don't have to uh, we don't have base, uh, we don't have uh, like an office uh, in Bahrain. Of course, our website uh, is a blog, so that's why it is a little bit uh, uh, complicated. But still, we, we, do, we do communicate and organize by, by, by the email. And we, 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 communicate. we, we have like a, a lot of uh, uh, groups, we communicate by, by groups and uh, chat groups, so we, we can do this kind of uh, things. Even Still, we have a problem with surveillance technology that they are spying on the activists uh, who are communicating with each other. Yeah, but still, this is the only way because uh, even in the ground, you could be uh, arrested. So that's why we are using kind of social media and, uh, to communicate with each other uh, uh, and, and coordinate and, uh, and cooperate. But and we are uh, doing a, a good job despite that. Uh, still, we have a lot of way to coordinate. Thank you very much. Um, Roland, we will have heard you. Uh, Roland, the UN, UN Human Superiority Review only began in earnest in 2008. It's emerged as one of the most effective UN tools to examine the human rights situation at the national level. According to UPR Info's most recent report in 2014, which highlighted that 48% 40 of recommendations have either, either been partially or fully implemented at the midterm midterm review. The UPR mechanism is also an important way to encourage substances to perform domestically. Roland, can you speak just a bit about the primary entry points 
for engaging with civil society and the UPR, and how you believe civil society can use the UPR to enhance their ongoing advocacy and pressing human rights issues. First of all, thank you, uh, thank you very much all for this, uh, this panel, and I'd also like to thank the, the THRB for organizing this, this event. Um, uh, you, you mentioned this uh, forty-eight percent that we documented in, in, a, in, a, in our latest report. I'd like to um, give some background behind this, uh, behind this number because obviously this does not this forty-eight percent is, is an average of among one hundred and sixty-five countries based on information we received from NGOs, governments, and UN agencies. So, obviously, this does not necessarily apply to Bahrain, um, uh, which, is, uh, which is one of the countries where maybe the UPR has less uh, impact than in other countries. Now we'll go back to, 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 to that and for, for what reason. But, but we do see some positive uh, elements in, in the UPR process. And uh, to name a few, starting by the, let's say, uh, Structural way of, of, of engaging and NGOs can uh, submit information to the UPR to, um, to document uh, the situation and to influence on what states will uh, raise on each other. Uh, NGOs can also uh, do direct advocacy, obviously, with, uh, with diplomats in Geneva or in embassies. They can approach uh, the diplomats that will make questions and recommendations to their, to their governments. Uh, we ourselves, the uh, Pierre School, also organize, organize pre sessions where we, uh, we provide a platform for NGOs to meet with diplomats in Geneva to again uh, raise some concerns about the situation and suggest recommendations to, to be made. NGOs can also make a statement at the Diplomats Council. Uh, next week, we will have uh, the adoption of the reports of countries that were reviewed last November, and NGOs can come to Geneva or send a video, which is quite an innovative uh, tool that has been developed by the, by the office, which is uh, I like that. And just can uh, send a written or make an oral statement or send a video um, to comment on the, the review that happened uh, of that country and highlight uh, shortcomings of the reviews, uh, uh, underline the, the Responses that the governments gave to, to certain recommendations, so that's a, that's another opportunity. And then NGOs obviously can engage in the, in the, in the follow-up, so working on the implementation of the recommendations when doing what the government is doing, and then that, in that framework they can produce a midterm report. So a couple of years after the country has been reviewed, they can uh, they can submit the report. They can also come to Geneva and make statements. Uh, as we and there, uh, see, I'd like to, talking about meeting report, I'd like to highlight the uh, ADHRB uh, meeting report on Bahrain that was published, uh, I believe, uh, last year, and uh, which is a very, very good exercise. And this is one way of keeping, let's say, the engagement of civil society on the, on the issue and to keep the, the spotlight on the commitments of the government. So, the written submissions, the advocacy in Geneva, the uh, statements at the Human Rights Council. Uh, midterm reporting, that's kind of a, the ways that NGOs can engage. But I'd like to go beyond and talking about the UPR process and highlight maybe a few points that um, a few spaces that were created through the UPR. First, I'd like to s highlight the, the, and we talked about, uh, about it a little bit, how NGOs can communicate and work together at the UPR. The UPR has really provided an opportunity for NGOs that were not working on the same issues to come together and discuss the situation with the country has been a lot of coalitions created, national coalitions, uh, among national NGOs created um, in, the, in the preparation for the UPR where NGOs working on different issues will come together, draft a report together and then present it to the government and present it to the international community. So the UPR has provided this opportunity for NGOs to meet. NGOs, uh, UPR has also provided opportunities for NGOs to talk with the government, it might not be the case in and it's not the case in every country, obviously. But um, in many countries, the UPR has uh, slightly changed the perception that states have their half of their NGOs and NGOs have of their government. And is, at least the UPR is trying to push for more cooperation between government and civil society. Again, it's not possible everywhere, but we've seen in numerous countries where 
this uh, usual uh, mistrust or distrust that happens in the country can, for certain occasions, including the UPI, can be put aside to uh, sit down and discuss uh, discuss your needs. Uh, the UPI has, has a political nature, and this is quite important. It's uh, Good and bad, I will say. I will focus on the good aspect of it, is that uh, NGOs through the UPR can push the government to actually uh, act on the commitments they made in other uh, forums, such as the treaty bodies where they ratify conventions and then they sometimes do not appear at treaty bodies, then the UPR has an opportunity to add some political pressure by the through other states making repeating those recommendations, emphasizing those commitments, and, and therefore the UPI can be this extra push that makes states uh, uh, commit to their, um, implement their commitments in, in terms of human rights. So this is interesting, and you just should use that. They can also then use the embassies they have in their country to push states uh, that made the recommendations to um, include those UPI recommendations in the bi bilateral dialogue, in the development framework, Etc. Etc. To make sure that uh, their government is reminded of the commitments they took at the UPR and in other mechanisms such as treaty bodies, making sure that they also have this political pressure on top of the UN pressure, which is also always uh, useful sometimes to be pressurized by friends or non-friends. Uh, I would also like to talk maybe about what the UPR is not and what NGOs should not expect from. Yeah, because this is quite important, um, and Sophia did that as well at the beginning to set the, the frame of the, of the UN and what NGOs should not always expect from the UN, because obviously uh, the, the UN and the UPR can solve everything. So the UPR will not end up in a naming and shaming exercise, in, in, and, and a lot of NGOs get disappointed when they come to the UPR for the first time and they hear the international, many, many states in praising their government when their perspective as an NGO is entirely different. Uh, it's, it's part of diplomacy, it's part of the game, it's, uh, and there will not be a condemnation of, of the government uh, through the UPR process. So that's one thing. Um, and the other thing is that the UPR is not necessarily fit for urgent situation. There's a very set calendar where we know five, sometimes 10 years in advance when the next review will take place, more or less. Uh, so this UPI is not fit to react to what the situation is happening in the countries. And for example, the Arab Spring, the UPI of, of countries was set the way it was, and uh, we saw that for, for, uh, for, for example, for Syria. Um, the UPI happened a few months after the UPR. In other countries it happened just before, etc., etc. So, and that's, that's the way it is, and people should not expect really too much reactivity, let's say. So this, uh, this will be the one we will answer in the questions. Thank you, Roland. You, you mentioned that UPR can be used um, as an advocacy tool for civil society groups, both at the council and nationally. Can you discuss a bit about what steps NGOs in the national setting can take to advocate for the implementation of recommendations? After the UPR has happened, what can NGOs do to encourage their governments and work with other stakeholders to ensure that these recommendations are fully implemented? Well, I think first, uh, it's very important to make the UPR a little bit known in the country because usually the, the government during its UPR is represented by its Ministry of Foreign Affairs or Ministry of Justice, so there's a handful or delegation much bigger, there's maybe 10, 15 people that know about it, but the rest of the government, the, rest, the other ministries don't necessarily know about it, parliamentarians do not know about it, etc., etc. So it's important as an NGO to do some awareness raising uh, through media, if possible, and through the network. NGOs have sometimes a lot of uh, region, um, they are uh, based, they have a lot of uh, contacts in the regions, they have some offices in the region, so that's an opportunity for them to reach out to their to their constituencies as NGOs and, and talk about the UPR. They can, for example, one way is for example to translate um, the recommendations of the UPR into the national languages. I know that the UN has been very supportive of that um, in, in translating into the national languages. 
is a few separate from the six UN languages, so the documents will be translated in the six languages, so the UPR recommendations will be in the six languages, but not in others. So there's an opportunity there to, to make them uh, easier to access. So there's this awareness raising uh, that I talked about. Um, then there's this uh, monitoring, so NGOs can try to, on their side, develop um, an implementation plan for each recommendation, decide what should be the action taken by which government, uh, which ministry or which department, and, and um, what type of indicators should be, should be put in place to monitor this. So you just develop this implementation plan and then share it with the government, share it with parliamentarians, uh, etc., to try to influence the, the, the roadmap that the government will, will develop to, to work on the implementation of recommendations. And then they should also document what the government is actually doing. So in that, contacting the different ministries, the parliamentarians to know what actions are being taken by the government is, is quite useful. Um, the UN says that between 60 to 80% of UPR recommendations are uh, requiring uh, parliamentary action. So that's why I'm insisting on the role of parliamentarians in the forum. And then NGOs, after documenting, they can uh, nationally by producing a midterm report and sharing it with again the different actors. They can also share it with the UN, they can come here and make statements. So I think this uh, awareness raising, documentation, monitoring and reporting is, uh, are the three ways that NGOs can, um, can engage uh, on the forum. Thank you, Roland. Now, just to add on that, really, in our experience, we've also seen that, you, that UPR is a, it helps resuscitate conversations nationally that were maybe off the agenda. It provides civil society nationally as an entry point to engage with government to talk about issues that maybe are too sensitive or otherwise wouldn't be addressed. I mean, UPR really, we, we're seeing that nationally, um, it provides a, a safe and secure place to, to engage with government, um, to, to, as I said, address issues that sometimes are neglected in other ways. Um, we'll now turn to the floor for questions. Um, I would encourage everyone to state their name and organization. We will take questions in clusters of three. Um, and please raise your hand. Yes, is this working? Okay. Um, so thank, thank you for, uh, you know, again, just from, from ADHRB, if I could just throw in a question early on here. I, I know that uh, particularly concerning actually the, the UPR process, well, and I'd like to, to ask a, just two quick follow-up questions here. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about what the UPR process is. At this point, we also know that, uh, you know, it's only in second cycle, it's still sort of a developing uh, mechanism of of the council, um, and we see the third cycle coming up soon. Uh, you know, we saw the mechanism adapt between the first and second cycle to, to try to you know, continue to perfect uh, you know, the, the role of this mechanism. Uh, do you see, you know, what can we maybe expect? I don't know if you have any uh, you know, sort of insight to share or, or thoughts on, on where you see this mechanism going in the third cycle, um, or ways that, that it can possibly be continue to be strengthened or, or utilized more effectively in, in the third cycle. Um, and then also, uh, you know, our, our event here is, you know, focused primarily on, on civil society engagement of, of these UN mechanisms, but you brought up, uh, you know, the role that parliamentarians and that parliaments can play, um, you know, and, and if we have any parliamentarians here that, that can, uh, can benefit from your insight as well on, on how uh, you know, the, the national parliaments or particularly even, uh, you know, particularly uh, anyone involved with from the human rights angle and a human rights committee from a national parliament uh, can utilize the UN mechanisms uh, or the recommendations made, uh, you know, can use their role uh, in their legislative capacity then to, uh, to push their governments to, to fully implement uh, the different recommendations that were accepted from, from a country's UPR process. Um, any further insight on that would be, would be welcome. Thank you. Hi, uh, James Susano of ADHRB. Not for uh, ADHRB to dominate the questions at all, but my question is for Sapir. Uh, you mentioned that civil society can engage with treaty bodies, yet for a state that hasn't signed the optional protocols, engagement with treaty bodies is necessarily more limited. 
Uh, still further, many states haven't even signed many of the most important treaties in the human rights legal regime. For example, Saudi Arabia hasn't even signed the ICCPR. How best can civil society engage with treaty bodies in these situations? Are there any further questions? Um, if not, we might start in reverse order and talk to you. Thanks so much for that question. I, I, I think the, um, the one answer is, is that uh, the, the treaty body mechanisms um, work where countries have ratified treaties. So if a country has not ratified treaties, then it's very difficult to, to, to bring uh, concerns and questions to a particular committee uh, about that country. Is, uh, even the re remit to their work, they, they, um, they're, they're not a party to that, uh, to that work. So I think at, outside of that, um, there, there are still ways to bring, uh, it, it's still a question of content, um, that that content can, uh, uh, in terms of behavior, in terms of human rights violations or situations, oftentimes um, the same kinds of content can be brought to treaties that um, uh, have been ratified. So, for example, if, if ICCPR hasn't been ratified, but uh, but the Child Rights Convention has been ratified, there are elements about uh, maybe uh, the exercise of public freedoms that you will find in, in the Child Rights Convention that can be expressed through engaging with that committee or through the the, the other committees, the other treaties that that country has ratified. So. So not, not to, to focus on one and, and uh, convention or treaty, but, but to see the opportunities in all of them. For, for example, discrimination you will find across all the conventions. It's common and you can bring in issues relating to, say, to, to migrant workers, not just within um, the Migrant Workers Convention, but it, it could, uh, it could uh, also be brought in under, under the CEDA, under the CERD, under under the cat, under, under many others. I mean, it's the way you package it, but I think that's possible. Also, the fact that the, um, the, the content of the information can also be shared with, with the special procedures and, and the universal periodic review. So there are ways to, to, to share that information outside of, of, of a particular treaty. Um, two, uh, two questions were addressed to me. First, what to expect from the third cycle? It's a, it's a very good question. <coughs> Sorry. Um, there's already been, there's are, there are some discussions starting in Geneva very, very slowly. Uh, some questionings in the corridors and, and so on and so on. So let's make it a bit more official. Um, what we expect, we, UPM, what we expect from the third cycle is maybe a bit more teeth to the mechanism. Uh, what we want is better scrutiny into the level of implementation of recommendations. Um, at the moment, it's a bit left to everyone to find out what the government under review has actually implemented over the last five years. You need to read the national report, you need to read, read the compilation, you need to read the NGO information, you need to meet with NGOs to understand whether, as a government, as a state, the recommendations you made four years ago were implemented or not. So what we want is better clarity from the state on review and from the developing a mechanism that could uh, provide a, an objective assessment of the level of implementation of those recommendations before the review. So <clears throat> the countries uh, reviewing the state on review will have um, uh, a clear picture of what's the situation in the country, what has been implemented or not, and can start from that. Uh, now it feels that the UPI is starting every second, I mean, starting to review the second cycle. Uh, without referring too much to the first cycle. So I think there's an effort to be made also from the part of the state recommending. Now, the role of parliamentarians, uh, well, we believe that they can first uh, get informed on what's happening, uh, first of the, the government, the commitments of the government, then of the action of the government, for that they can put questions forward to the government and the, the parliament. Uh, the Human Rights uh, Committee can also um, of uh, these, these issues more closely by meeting with NGOs, meeting with other actors to know what's 
happening and if the action of the government is actually uh, in, in, in correlation with their commitments. So I think informing themselves and informing as well maybe the, all the NGOs of what the actions of the parliament is because the information goes to size, the NGOs can bring to the parliament into what's happening in the country, but also the parliament can share with the NGOs what the government is actually doing and what the parliament is doing, which is not always clear, surprisingly. Um, and then they can increase pressure on the government. Basically, the parliament has the power to ratify conventions. So if uh, the, the convention is ratified, then the government has to make sure that it is implemented. So it's basically increasing the pressure on the, on the government. Um, my question is from uh, Said Yusuf. Have you ever seen retaliation against victims and how it affects the process of documentation? Because we have uh, documented the uh, Yeah, we have uh, documented uh, a lot of human rights abuses on a daily basis. Some of them uh, uh, in the ground, uh, we documented directly on what's happening. Uh, and we have a big, uh, big team documenting that in the ground. And also, uh, we, do, we do the documentation and we meet with the uh, family members. And we have uh, and, and the process that we meet with the victim, if possible, or, uh, or uh, to take a, a direct uh, contact from her mother through his lawyer, or sometimes from his personally, sometimes they get the chance. Uh, to, to, call the, to call the activists or to call the NGOs or to, to call uh, the lawyers. So uh, this is the process that we directly meet the victims, take his testimony, and then we we'll also come through the, uh, through, through the lawyer. And then after the documentation is clear to a statement, this is the process that uh, the testimony, we, we turn it to a statement, and then from a statement also we, we work with the UN mechanism or to the or to do that because it's so, yeah, so directly from the victims and until the finish to the UN mechanism. Are there any further questions from the audience? Yes, uh, my question is uh, to the panelists. If we all believe that uh, the UPR is a place where diplomats meet, engage in interactive dialogue, and it's, as we feel, it's a pure state game. And if we wait, wait for almost four years to know whether that state has implemented the recommendation, and there is no mechanism uh, to make sure that it did truly implement the recommendation. So how can the UBR mechanism be effective, especially where the NGOs submit their parallel report, which is stated already that no true implementation from that state. So where we will go from here, how this can be effective if, if there is no mechanism to enforce that recommendation. Thank you. Are there any further questions? Hi, I'm Ahmed Ali from Bed. Uh, my question is actually for Safir. Um, we've heard some of um, the reprisals faced by civil society, by state users, ranging from defamation campaigns from governments in their own country to yelling outside side events at the UN Human Rights Council. Um, in those situations where NGOs are taking part in engaging with the UN with their various mechanisms and as a direct result while they're engaging are facing reprisals at home and threats of court cases or further reprisals, what would you recommend for those NGOs to do and how would the OHCHR engage and react to similar threats or actual acts of reprisal? Okay, so uh, <clears throat> that's uh, 
that's a terrific question. I mean, look, um, I, I mentioned earlier that uh, the work that all of you are doing are, it, it takes a long time and it, it's slow and it's, and it's sometimes dangerous. So I think there is that inherent risk that's always there. I think, um, and, and I mentioned it before in terms of managing expectations, uh, the, uh, the UN can prevent it. You know, I, I don't think uh, any of the actors are able to, to stop it. it it's, it's this ugly feature that, that you will see because you know states, um, when they run out of ideas, they, they use violence and force. And, and that's what they're doing, whether it's here or, or in the country. I think we can try our best to, 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 to minimize the risk um, or, or to, to uh, call attention to it. And, and call it for what it's worth. So, so happen that these things are about the Lack of, 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 uh, of uh, enforcement, but it's what we have. It's better that we have this than nothing. But I, I think at the same time, it's it's really getting the you know the, the discussions around what comes out. It's all about. It's really all about you know being better at, at communicating ideas and, and persuasively encountering this information. I think so. It's it's. I, I think it's not. It's not the best thing. Certainly not. I think what is that the is to make it the UPI. One of those recommendations. Uh, Level is this is it's getting it somewhere. Thank you, Roland. Um, we have time for one more question, and then we'll go to concluding remarks. Um, does anyone who like to make a connection? Yes, please, Mike. Uh, so, uh, just one, one final bit of uh, follow up here. That I actually have two quick questions here. Uh, the first is for, is for Sophia. Um, just as far as you know, clarification, you know, here in the council, um, as far as making you know, making interventions or hosting side events like this, um, you know the role of civil society is limited to uh, groups that have ECOSOC accreditation, which of course is you know so a long and, and complicated process in order to, to reach that level. Um, as far as engaging with civil society mechanisms or engaging UN mechanisms, uh, treaty bodies, the UPR process, or um, or the special procedures, you know, are there any sort of, of limitations or rest restrictions on civil society that? You know, the necessity of having ECOSOC accreditation or something like that, or or can any you know any group that has a presence on you know, on the ground documenting uh, or or engaging um, uh, regarding civil society abuses, uh, can they all engage these mechanisms openly as well? Um, and then the other question uh, is is for Roland uh, more specifically again on the, on the UPR process. Um, we, we touched on this a little bit before, but is there 
you know, is there any way within the UPR process um, to, you know, to really concentrate on, on looking at the, the previous rounds of, of the UPR that the countries have gone through, um, recommendations that were accepted and supported and uh, encouraged by the government uh, throughout the last one or two uh, cycles that have then not been implemented still. Um, you know, we had talked, to, you, you mentioned how, um, how the UPR process is not supposed to be reactive to, you know, individual uh, you know, small human rights abuses that happen one at a time, or it's not very reactive, but it, it is more targeted at these like systemic problems that you'll see over time. Um, and so if you have problems that are systemic and, and, and long, uh, long lasting, that then have been raised with previous UPR cycles, uh, but then have continued to be ignored or, or acted against um, in, in subsequent years. Uh, you know, is there any sort of way through the UPR process uh, you know, to really re-emphasize uh, you know, continued problems that have then been ignored throughout uh, previous cycles? Thank you. Thank you. First, I'd like to clarify what I meant in the sense that the UPR is not reactive in the sense that and if a country is scheduled to be reviewed on 1st November 2016, if something happened next month, the date of the review will not change. But I, I think the UPR is also tailored for individual cases. It's for small, I mean small, it's never small for the, for the victims. So let's say um, new human rights emergencies, I mean new human rights violations, I think the UPR can target anything and we, we've seen uh, countries mentioning individual uh, uh, individuals and names in the UPR. And a lot of states are against that, obviously, but we think that the UPR is totally appropriate for that. Now, when a U recommendation that's been accepted and not been implemented, we think states should repeat them over and over again. Uh, they should say, as previously recommended, uh, to make sure that the state review is reminded that uh, this recommendation was made before and they accepted it. Etc. Etc. So I think the more repetition, the more countries. There's a lot of criticism of the UPR for having a lot of recommendations, a lot of them repeating each other. So let's say having 15 countries saying the same thing. We think it's good. We think it's important that the international community shows its concern, its uh, concerns about some issues. So the more recommendation on the issue, the better. It really shows there's a problem. So I think repetition and and. Uh, uh, in terms of from one cycle to another, and repetition within the same review among different states is, is a good thing. Great. Uh, thanks, Michael. Um, about ECOSOC status, I think uh, basically um, ECOSOC uh, status, um, you apply to the UN. All it is is a ticket to get into this building for the, the council, uh, its meetings, and uh, the UPR working group. That's all. The, the rest of the UN system does not require it. So to engage with the treaty bodies, all the different nine treaty bodies, you don't need ECOSOC status. To send, share, engage with the, the special procedures, you don't need ECOSOC status. To send information to the UPR uh, for, for uh, stakeholder information, you don't need ECOSOC status. There's a lot of emphasis put on ECOSOC status. Of course, it's great to be able to come and engage in the intergovernmental meetings, like to actually get into the room, but, uh, but uh, you can still, th there's the whole other universe to, to send information to the Office of the High Commissioner. We don't, we don't require any kind of registration. It's just a, the, the, the content and the quality of the information that really drives them. Thanks. Thank you, Shafir. Um, I think we'll move on to very briefly concluding remarks um, specifically, if you if you speak to what steps the, our respective institutions can take to encourage um, to be more responsive to civil society and to be more effective in addressing human rights violations, I know it's a very long question to have today. But if you could may, maybe provide one or two steps with each of your institutions and respectively um, enhance the work. Basically, to say, just to repeat myself, to say that the, the change is hard. Uh, so we, we start off knowing that change is really hard. Uh, the UN human rights system—it's it's just one element in an overall strategy for for change. Um, 
but uh, recognize that it's also an important one. And in order to engage, in order to use this, you need to be informed about, about its language, how it works, and, and learn how the, it's composed of different elements, uh, and, and to know, to appreciate what you get out of each of them and, and how they complement each other. Um, and, and I think uh, in, in terms of effectiveness, I, I think for me, uh, my, my impression is that ultimately it's really about ideas and, and we have to be better at, at, at communicating effectively and persuasively locally and nationally. At the same time, we have to be better at, at countering misinformation. Um, I, I think uh, whether it's here or whether it's back home um, with, with, uh, with, with propaganda and myths that, that twirl around, I, I think that there are, are creative and unique ways that we really need to, to connect with each other in order that the messages that we that we are trying to to get across uh, get across. Otherwise, uh, I mean, you know, somebody said, uh, uh, you know, nothing. You know, you, you can have good words on a paper, but uh, it won't do anything. It, it won't do anything on its own. Something has to, to happen with it. So that's that's kind of my, my two cents. Thank you, Sophia. What you said. So about the, uh, the, the communication, uh, I think that uh, you, you know, we, 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 the government to engage more with the civil society and uh, try to work with them instead of silencing them, allowing them to share their thoughts uh, to, to come to an understanding and, uh, and also uh, to allow civil society to work uh, freely with us with the organization uh, uh, using the, the human rights. Good environment and civil society uh, to work uh, and help without uh, domination. I think generally what uh, what this system can do for, for better NGO engagement is better support of NGOs. So I would say, being being pragmatical, it's it's more funding for NGOs in the uh, working on the PR, working on other mechanisms. On the ground, because supporting national and civil society in their work on, on the different uh, human rights mechanisms, that's um, unfortunately that's always going to be a, a key issue for NGOs engagement. Uh, NGOs, a lot of NGOs do a lot of work without with very little, and, and this is quite important to make sure that NGOs keep being supported. There's a lot also of uh, actors that don't really want to invest in the human rights. It's understand how the UN works and, and make sure that the NGOs working with the UN should be supported financially. Uh, how also we as for example UPI Info can do uh, to work better, I think it's 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 quite interesting, it's quite important to, to explain better what the UN is, what the UN does, what the UPR is, what the UPI does. I mean if I have a struggle explaining my own family then my job is you know how I'm supposed to explain people who don't know what we do and what is it for. So it's, um, it's also our effort to people that come to these uh, nice rooms every day um, to explain better what we do and how we do it and why we do it. People don't know what they can get from the UN. It's, you have to convince people that the UN is good. There's a bad publicity about the UN for s some reasons, but we really have to, to, to work on that to make sure that uh, people know. And then if people know about the UN, people know about the human rights mechanism, then Thing will have a better chance of making them more effective. Thank you very much, Ron, and our panelists for their complete remarks. I won't, will not attempt to summarize what we've heard today, um, but I, I think what we have heard in general is that there's no one way, correct way to engage with UN mechanisms and with documents and with collaborations. So there's a multifaceted approach that requires engaging with treaty bodies, special procedures. The HRC Secretary at OSCHR at national, national and regional levels. Um, it requires a protracted, long, engaged um, process within UPR, nationally, with international partners, coming to Geneva where possible. Um, and of course, I, the example in Bahrain is illustrated with what can happen. Bahrain is a country of 500,000 people. Um, with very limited civil society in the country due to restrictions nationally. 
but what you see as a result of the concerted approach and advocacy of national and international groups on Bahrain, because of the innovative ways of documenting human rights violations, because of the engagement with special procedures, because of their resilience, that you can get issues, even on a country small Bahrain, on the agenda of the council, on the agenda of special procedures. So that requires a multifaceted, long-term engaged approach. Um, so what I would encourage is after this discussion, if you'd like more information about specifically how to do this, that we approach the panelists. Um, thank you so much to everyone for taking part today. I hope you enjoyed this discussion as much as I did. And to our, and to our panelists, thank you so much for your very um, interesting intervention. And of course, to our sponsors, co-sponsors, and for being for PCHR. Thank you very, very much.